Good afternoon, all. Hi. Uh, welcome to our presentation today. Um, I'm Luke McNeese. I'm the founder of cloudtroopers.com. Um, we're here for the business showcase. Um, I know we've got a pretty mixed audience here today, a mix of geeks. Um, and uh, we're here today to try and show you some of the things we've learnt over the last couple of years with some rather large US customers. Um, and there's also probably uh, decision makers out there, business folk who are here um, trying to evaluate Drupal, does it work in the enterprise, um, how does open source work in a big company where there are strict rules and regulations. Um, so hopefully we, we can address a lot of people. Hang on, we've lost the screen again. Apple, huh? What? Let's just go to the backup plan. <coughs> Sorry, we had the Apple TV, but we'll fix that along the way, I'm sure. trade show be without audio visual issues. <laughs> Come on. Oh, it's not bad, it's just coming. It's thinking. Ah, uh, we're back. Is there a way we can lower the projector a bit? The top's hanging off the top. Anyway, so the agenda. Um, quick overview of who we are. Um, showcase of how we've made Drupal work in a really massively scalable way. Um, and then for the business folks, uh, an enterprise checklist. If you're out there evaluating other uh, systems integrators, um, these are some of the questions you should be asking of, of what they can deliver. <clears throat> and finally, um, one of the tools we've built over the last couple of years is called the black box timeline. Um, when you're in the enterprise and your code's running on hundreds of servers, it's often very difficult to, to, to debug um, in a production environment because you haven't got access to the production servers. So we've written a nice little tool which allows you to aggregate disparate data from various different servers and events and glue them together in a, in a nice timeline. And that's what uh, Mikey and, and the crew over there will be showing us a bit later on. A um, bit about us. We're a full project lifecycle development company um, specializing in open, so open source. We're not necessarily only open source. Um, we also have Oracle and a few other proprietary skill sets out there. Um, but primarily uh, focusing on Drupal, Symfony, Magento, uh, systems operations teams. Um, we've got great program and project management. Um, we've also got a very, very special division in our company called the Continuous Integration Team, specializing in uh, website testing, mobile testing, and internationalization testing. I'll drag on a bit about that a bit later on just to show you some of the stuff we're doing. Um, we're 50 people. We've got office, the main office is in Cluj, Romania. Um, there's about 10 of us in the UK, and we've got a couple of bodies in the United States as well for our uh, US customers. Um, we have, there it is. We've only been alive for two years, but this isn't our customer list. This is uh, the companies we've all worked for over the last uh, 15, 20 years. Um, there's some mostly US companies you'll be seeing there, but a couple of European things here and there. Um, a lot of travel background, a lot of banking background. Um, we've got some in-house black box trading systems, uh, order, you know, high frequency trading systems, um, right through to uh, Universal Studios uh, website in Orlando. Um, where we built the uh, Harry Potter e-commerce website when they launched Harry Potter World there. So we've got a, a wide view of uh, the, the spectrum out there. Um, one last thing, uh, I think we might also become a, an IVF clinic in the last uh, two years 
out of 50 people, we've had uh, six biological deploys, and we've got another three on the way. In fact, Georgiana's up there at the moment, and you'll see uh, how that's progressing nicely. Um, so today, I wanted to mainly showcase Allegiant Airlines. It's a low-cost carrier based in Las Vegas in the United States. It's about 100 aircraft. Um, it's very similar to Ryanair and uh, EasyJet in terms of what they offer. You know, you pay for everything. You can buy a cheap ticket, then you've got to carry on bag and check in bags and seat assignments and all that good stuff. So they decided about two and a half years ago that their old technology just didn't give them what they needed. They needed flexibility, they needed scalability. Um, so they embarked on a, a three plus year transformation project across their entire enterprise. They're one of the few airlines in the world that have their own reservation engine. So they've gone out and written a huge Java based uh, reservation engine. Um, we've written on the top of that Drupal and Symfony um, and a few other technologies to, to present to the world. Um, they're an unusual company in the sense that most airlines sell their tickets through CRSs or GDS systems like Sabre or Worldspan. Um, they sell everything through their website, all the call center, which is also the website, or the travel agent portal, which is also the same website. We maintain one uh, source base across all three portals, and all sales go through that. Um, they're not a small airline. They do over a billion dollars in sales every year. Um, and in the last 12 months, our Drupal Symphony system has sold over a billion dollars. I don't know how many other people out there for a, a competition are... I don't know if the word is competition, but I, if anyone else has done over a billion dollars of sales on a Drupal site in the last 12 months, I'd love to know. It's a good competition. Um, where are we? So when we started this, we wanted scalability. That was the biggest problem. The last website would fall over with a couple of thousand people on it. So what we did, we came up with a Drupal system for all the metadata, for the templating, for the workflow, all the good stuff that we love Drupal for. But what we decided to do was make Drupal a minor player in the actual live production environment. So we have Varnish. If it wasn't for Varnish, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be out of a job. Um, when, so when you come and visit the home page, which is number one, that page will come from Varnish. In there's a search box. You can submit a search. That search goes to Drupal, who has to register the search. But at that point, Drupal's game is over. It submits it into Symphony. That's number three. Um, it also gives a page back to the customer. So the customer's sitting there now with a page with a spinning dial waiting for results. So Symphony then goes and does a query against the reservation engine at the bottom. That's the Java system. That takes a little bit of time. It takes its results, and it puts it into the search results cache. That's a key value database at the moment. We're using memcached. Um, but ultimately, we will be moving to Mongo, um, assuming we can get through all the stress testing to prove that it works. And it's looking great at the moment. But uh, the key value database is not really that fussed about. But it has been the little engine that could, the system, um, handling more than uh, 10,000 customers at a time quite easily, uh, 100 searches a second, very uh, high-end stuff. Um, with extremely fast response times. One of the fastest travel sites out there. So I think uh, on that front, it has been a great success. So what we did, because obviously you've got a production environment, you want to be up 24-7 all the time, you don't want to be down for code releases, um, and you also want to be able to do A-B testing. So we've, we went with a three siloed approach. So one silo could handle the entire site load. Um, we generally have three in play at any given moment, except during code deploys, where we'll take one silo down to do code pushes. Um, we can also use the silo three as a B test if we want to. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of analytics running in the background to compare whether or not A or B are, is working or not, but uh, it works in a very elegant way. Um, so a code deploy is as simple as draining sessions from a silo takes about 25 minutes to drain all the sessions. We shut the silo down. We deploy the code through RPMs and all the good stuff that makes it automated. And then we bring that silo back up. And then we'll go to silo two and repeat that process. All up, it's about a three hour process at the moment. Um, we've got some things underfoot where we should be able to bring that down to 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but we've got to get a few, like I already mentioned Mongo. We need to get that approved before we can actually speed that up, the entire process up to 10 minutes. Now, I've made a point of only mentioning code at the moment. I'll address content deployment in just a second, because they are two separate things. Of course, in the, in, the, in the enterprise environments, you're going to have to get used to a huge process to get anywhere. 
Now, you know, Drupal, when I started, was a you know, one, one machine system. You could push live code. You could go and install modules. You know, all the good stuff that, that got me over the line. I'm like, hey, this is an amazing module. I can do what I want. But when you go into the enterprise, the net op, network ops team kind of hate that. You know, they, they won't let you anywhere near the production environment. And, you know, at the bottom, I haven't even put development on this. So way down the bottom here, you've got your developers working wherever else. You're pushing into GitHub. You're building RPMs for uh, content and code deployment. You go into integration. You get to play with all the other systems working at the same time. And eventually, you come to QA, where you all go in at the same time, two, three-week process of testing. Then that gets green-lighted. Then you go to staging for a day. And then ultimately, you roll out to production. That's a, a three to four-week process, which used to take 10 minutes, but now it takes three to four weeks. But it, get, it, buy, it buys you reliability. You know, with an operation that only sells things through a website, it can't afford to be down. Now, part of the problem with Drupal, and I'm sorry, I will mention a few bad things, um, configuration management. At the moment, it's all embedded in the same database. Now, I heard Jai's uh, mentioning in the uh, initial keynote that in uh, Drupal 8, they're going to be addressing uh, configuration management, and that will be a fantastic day when you separate content and configuration to two separate entities. Because each of our environments and staging, integration, and production, you'll be able to just change instantly with configuration files without having to write fancy Drush scripts to go and deploy stuff. So what we've done, we have the Drupal master. That is where all the content is maintained. That's where all the code releases eventually make their way to it. But when we're in doing content deploys, we're pushing from the master Drupal out to the, the various silos. And I said content here, not code. During content deploys, we can push live content updates to any of the silos any time of day without bringing the whole site down. We've got a, a unique cache warming process um, using the cache warmer module, um, along with a few other magical things. Um, because if you go into production with a cold Drupal cache, you will collapse in about 10 to 15 seconds with 5,000 people on site. So we've managed to engineer our, our way around that. And so 24-7, our business can deploy content without any hiccups to their operation. Um, we're at the point now where actually the net ops team doesn't even get involved. The content owner um, can push content at 11 PM from her couch sitting at home over the VPN. Um, this is a little bit of a schematic of how we do it. We, uh, the tricky thing with Drupal is the user database. When I mean, you can use sharding, but there's one user database. So you've got three production silos, you're sharing users across all three of them. It means you can lose a silo and a customer can be bounced to another silo and they don't lose anything. Um, sharding will take you so far. There are some guys here with some amazing technology that I'm dying to look at, which might actually make it even more scalable than I thought. Um, but just keep in mind that the user's database is shared across all three of our silos at any given moment. Um, we also have a NoSQL cluster in there for search results, um, sessions, and any number of other things. Um, that, that gives us scalability and, most importantly, reliability, because relational databases just wouldn't get near that without some magical sharding technology that I haven't seen yet. Now, for the business folk. This is kind of what you're looking at for the enterprise. You're going to have to have a scalable and robust architect. I just took you through that. You're going to have to have scripted deploys. It's absolutely vital that you do not change anything code-related live on a production database. It'll screw with your caches. And once you screw with your caches, it's game over. You can have a warm varnish cache, but a cold Drupal cache, and you're absolutely toast. You're going to have to deliver packaged software. It's, you know, RPMs, Debian's. MSIs, whatever it is, you have to deliver that. You're going to have to have automated QA. We, we have scripts that I'll address later on that start from the very beginning in development and run all the way through to regression testing and real-time monitoring. <coughs> Same scripts everywhere. You're going to have to have systems monitoring. There's any number of tools out there that do good systems monitoring. Um, <coughs> our customer uses Nagios. Um, it's pretty good, but there's a lot of tools out there. Just make sure you've got one. Um, penetration testing. We have a team of guys um, in Cluj that have come in periodically every few months to bang the crap out of uh, our Drupals and see whether or not we can break it. 
Um, up to this stage, they haven't managed to break it other than a few little minor security patches here and there that we've actually pushed back into the community for things that we fixed. Um, and obviously security patching. It's not, you just don't launch a site and just let it sit there. You're going to have to continuously have someone monitoring all the security patches um, and making sure they get out to production as quickly as possible. Right, so on software delivery, your customer's uh, net, net operations team will have a flavor of choice. Our customer is a, a big believer in Red Hat, and they use satellite and for, for the controlling all of their software, and they use RPMs for delivery. If you're starting on a big long-term project, you've got to start thinking about this on day one. If you start addressing that two to three months down the track, the cat's already out of the bag. Um, as I've already mentioned, Drupal 7's configuration management is uh, tricky, and I'm being polite. It, it, it's one of the biggest bugbears of any system that I've used you know, over the last 10 years. But nonetheless, you can get around it, and hopefully Drupal 8 will address some of those problems. And day one, go down and start hanging out with the NetOps team. If you aren't friends with them, you're going to have a, a sad, sad journey on the overall project. Um, just having that friendly face at, that you can go and have a chat with and just run things past them before you go out there. Because a lot of these big companies, they're scared of open source, they've never seen it before, um, and they will freak out when you turn up with something and they don't understand what it is. I know this is kind of stupid, but you'd be surprised how many projects go south because people don't involve the people that actually have to run it. Um, scripted deploys. So we use Drush. I don't know if there's another tool, but it's amazing. Um, when you go into the enterprise, you're going to no longer have GUIs, you're going to have no longer command line access, and you're no longer going to be able to access the database, um, which can be rather difficult when your website's having major problems and you're not allowed to have a look at it. Again, it's the NetOps team who are sitting there trying to give you feedback. Um, we negotiated early on uh, a host account that we could log into on the machines with read-only access, and they'd only give us the password if there was a disaster. Um, that's happened once in two years. So keep that in your back pocket. Ask your NetOps team for a read-only account so you can get in in the thick of things to figure out what's going on. Um, and obviously, I'll get to the job server in a second, but your Drush scripts, it's great that you can run them in deploys and from RPMs, but also make sure you plug them into your job server so you can run things ad hoc whenever you need to. Now, continuous integration. Um, I've worked, geez, I don't know, 15, 20 years now, 15 years on the web. Um, customers rarely are willing to pay for it. They don't see the value. It's the, it's the ace in the hole on this project. It has been one of the greatest things I've experienced in all my years. Um, it's, not a, it's not a nice to have, it's a must have. Like a week after a coder started coding, meets with the CI guys, they start punching out an automated test. That test in development will then be used in QA. Once it's in QA, it'll be used to smoke test in staging and production. Um, We'll also use it for uh, live monitoring once it goes to production. All our jobs pump data back out to Nagios, which then graphs it into nice little graphs. How fast can a robot walk through the booking path? You know, how long does it take to pull back X number of pages? Any number of little tests. Um, basically, for every use case, you generally have a, a, an automated script. So that means when you come to load testing, you can use these scripts and statistically look at, you know, 40% of people come down the booking path, 20% of people go through online check-in, 10% of people are looking on uh, various marketing splash pages about Las Vegas or Orlando or whatever, and maybe 5% of people will be logged in editing their account. So you can take these continuous integration scripts, um, we use Selenium, and plug it into JMeter and you can do amazing real-life testing. It's, uh, it's, it's been a very, very handy tool. Um, we use Jenkins as a job server. It sits in the enterprise, and from that machine, we can run everything. We can do code deploys. We can go and um, run Drush scripts out into various production environments. Um, from time to time, we'll have caching issues, um, like Varnish might get out of sync. So we can remotely just log into Varnish from a single point of contact and clear the cache. Obviously, that's security restricted. Um, so we have to ask our nice NetOp teams to do that. But um, it has made us so much, it has increased our ability to respond in, in disaster situations. It also means if you build this up correctly, your business analysts and the like can go out and just press a button, fire up a, 
a Drupal instance in your uh, development cloud, look at the requirements for a given process, run through it all, test it, and close down that, all just using this Jenkins server to control everything. Uh, and obviously tie it in with your monitoring tool of choice, which is, in our world, Nagios. Um, another thing that I thought might be interesting before we jump into the demonstration of our remote debugging tool, I took a report of last month's hours. So roughly 33% a third was <coughs> development. Now, I don't know, 10 years ago, I think that probably would have been 80 or 90%. But uh, if you're going to deliver quality week after week, it's not only just development. We've got a 25 to 28% of our time is on QA, both manual and continuous integration. Um, obviously, we've got project management. We've got requirements gathering and system, systems ops. They help in the building of the RPMs, um, obviously, and helping our developers to take a piece of code, package it up, and be able to push it into a, into a package that the customer could, that can easily uh, install. Um, and obviously training and handing over. I'm a bit surprised it's only 2%. I thought it might be a bit more. Um, we didn't have a big release last month, is all I can say. It's usually about 5%. But as a business owner, you're probably expecting to only pay for the 33%. There's a lot more in there that, that happens to make sure that you deliver quality. Um, Okay, we're now going to demonstrate our enterprise debugging tool. So if you've got 120 machines out there, Drupal, Symphonies, um, Memcache, um, you name it, how do you, in our context, we have a booking path. Customer comes along, they start a search, they choose their flights, they get a hotel, they get upsells for rental cars and anything, any, any number of things along the way. And that could be serviced by any of 120 machines. So how do you go through 120 log files and figure out what the hell's gone on? So that's what we built for this. Because it was an airline, it was called the black box. Um, it sits at the back. We use, at the moment, syslog. Any machine can pass an event out on syslog. It all gets aggregated at the back end into a single place where we can then have a visual representation of someone's experience in the site. And by experience, I mean not so much what happens on the website. We use Google Analytics for that. But what happens on the server side? So you might start a search, but that might have six or eight different interactions with back-end systems. So we've now built a tool that allows you to easily do that. And are you guys ready? Do, do, do. Yeah. All right, I'd like to introduce you to Mikey. He's, uh, he's our CTO and uh, co-founder at Cloud Troopers. And Georgiana, and Niku, and Vlad. Are you gonna plug in or do you want the Apple TV? I need to plug in. So. What happened to us, it's that, um, as Luke mentioned, we had uh, quite a few uh, issues with um, the code initially. We've got quite a few systems that need to interact. We've got um, the front layer, which is a Drupal website. It has a JavaScript, a pretty much a large JavaScript application that runs in, inside Drupal. And then that one needs to talk to an intermediate layer, which is Symphony, and then one goes to talk to a Java system, and the Java system probably will talk to somebody else, and I guess everybody sooner or later will end up in that kind of situation, where you have all kind of systems that need to actually work together. And we discovered that it's absolutely impossible to do debugging. So if you go to I have a customer that actually claims that he couldn't reach a particular page or the booking didn't go through or something went wrong. There was uh, probably half a day, sometimes even a day of investigation. So our developers were actually more involved in tracking and finding the, the bugs instead of actually just uh, doing their job. So the, the main issue you've got with, uh, with, with this system is that every single framework, every single system that I've seen actually has a different type of logging. Everybody logs in files or in databases or somewhere. And the other thing that's really, really difficult to, to track is how to identify a single session end to end. The user comes in, he sees a page, and then he just browses. For him, it's just the browser. So we're thinking like how we can actually put all this together and give an overview of the develop for the developer to, to see everything in one page. Uh, initially, it looked like it's impossible, but then we start thinking more and more. And during our development, we discovered 
a few other things that uh, helped us to, to build this thing. So if we can put everything in one page, we'll take, we estimated it will take probably three hours to determine the bug. But after we start using this kind of system, actually was taking 15 minutes or even 10 minutes to identify. Specifically because some of the, the stacks where we're working with were not under our control. As I said, the Java or any other system, I don't know, the payment system, which we don't control. And um, one of the problem is that there isn't the generic way of, of logging. So we're looking at, at creating something that it's fit for everybody. And that's one big problem. The second problem we got is that everybody is concerned when you do logging about speed. So if you do a log and that takes, I don't know, 100 milliseconds, you'll quit doing that because if every single page has 10 things that you need to log, will be actually punishing on, on, on everything you do. So it needs to be to do testings really fast, right? So we actually went to re-evaluate the project and we said that um, we need speed and we need a simple way for everybody to be able to connect to this logger to actually collect the data. Okay, so what we did for, for speed, we, we realized that the, the longest thing is send a message and wait for the, the system to store the data and then come back and says, okay, I have did it. For the logging purposes, it's not necessarily a must to actually get an answer back. It's not something that you, you expect that uh, will not fail. Maybe it will fail, maybe not. You know, it's, it's kind of like NoSQL. Nobody actually guarantees you that NoSQL will store all the data uh, consistently and everything, it's, it's there. So you need to protect yourself against that. But we're looking into that world. So uh, an API that makes sense to us. And uh, a RESTful API is probably the simplest thing to do. I mean, just a very plain, basic interface where you just send messages and the system leaves you alone. You don't need to be concerned or be bothered by, by what happens in the background. This is a very basic, the simplest thing you can do. You're gonna have a time that you're gonna send to the, to the logger. You're gonna have a, a mask. And the big trick in this, in this system is to actually have a consistent glue system. So imagine you have a Drupal, and Drupal has a session, right? But that session can be actually sent to the JavaScript stack where you say, look, this is the session ID. Use this one when you do the logging. And the JavaScript talks to another service, which is a Symfony server. And you say, look, I'm, I'm making a request, and by the way, the session I'm, I'm actually using is this one. <coughs> and that system goes to the next one. So the only thing you need to propagate against, uh, against every single system you've got is a consistent way of retrieving this data. So you need to decide who's the master. In our case, it's actually Drupal. Drupal actually makes a, a hash, and then it's actually sent down the whole stack to the last level, which is straight into J in Java. And then in the message, because we're thinking, you can't actually use a static way of, of I mean, static, it's, it's a schema type uh, way of storing the data. We actually accept anything in the message. You can put there anything. It's a simple JSON, it's just a <coughs> one line message or it could be a very complicated structure. I'll show you that in, in a moment. The, um, the trick in here is you're gonna get a 409 if you did something wrong. Basically, you didn't put the, the minimum basic stuff into the message you sent. So you need to give the time, you need to give them, <coughs> you need to give a glue, uh, an ID and a message, uh, even if it's empty. But the biggest trick of all is the 204. I don't know if anybody in here ever used the 204 header. <coughs> There's anybody that used it? No, anybody? anybody? Right, 204, it's one of the biggest trick of HTTP. 204 says, I got your call. I'm not gonna answer to your call, <coughs> go away. This is a very important thing and people need to start looking more to the HTTP headers. The big trick is you receive uh, an incoming call, and you say, I've got it. So the system that actually makes the call can go away immediately. We're talking about milliseconds, 
right? Usually, if you try to log something, it can take, as I said, 100 milliseconds to get back. It's like, I've got it, I've stored it, everything's fine. With this thing, what you do, the first thing in the, in the, the header of the file, you just say, go away, I've got it. Leave me alone, which means that you can actually not spend time. Imagine that uh, you use curl. Curl, it's available all, probably in every single other platform. Right? It's the simplest way for actually inter uh, interacting with that API. And curl will go away in milliseconds. We're talking about anything between 5 and 20 milliseconds. It depends of, of what your network uh, um, capacity and, and uh, the lag, but it's, it's really, really fast. We're using this in, in, in other ways in our website. It's, it's really cool as, as a system. Uh, by the way, as a, just as an idea, you can use 204 to multi-thread PHP. Think about you want to start multiple processes. You can actually fire a process. If the process returns you a 204, you don't need to wait for that process to finish. You can actually fire another one and another one and another one, which is kind of like not really used in the PHP world. We use it, and we've seen some massive improvement in, in uh, what happens in, in the background. So I'll try to show you a small demo. Hopefully, the guides of uh, internet will help us. So what we got here, this is um, what we call the dashboard. I'll try to make it a little smaller so you can see it. Can anybody see it? Now, this is the, the basic interface we're using for the, um, for the time blockers, the, the timeline. It, it's very funny. We started with a timeline, and we're actually considering this a project that's like a black box that sits in, in somewhere and you work with. So that's why we call it a black box. It's practically a timeline. Right, so what I'm going to try to show you now is how this thing works. I'll, um, I'll try to push some data into the system so I can show you how it works and I will do the, the live demo. As you can see, it's really fast. We run the, the unit testing on the back, create all the information. It just shows on the screen immediately. Now, this is the glue that I was telling you. And you'll understand in a second why this glue is very important because it will help you to help the, the user that has a problem. I guess everybody got a phone call from, from somebody saying, oh, this customer can't actually get into our, our website or something doesn't work. It's like, what's wrong? Oh, we don't know, it doesn't work, right? And you can't actually figure it out and you don't know anything about that guy, but there's a way to solve that. I'll show you in a minute. Now, this is, I'll, I'll just pick one of the, the items in here. This is the, the, what we call the timeline. Now, what's in here, we have three bars. The bottom one is actually hour based by the way, this is not original work. This is a project that we adapted. It's called Timeline. You can find it in, uh, on the internet. Uh, has been abandoned about three, four years ago. So we picked up the code and we start improving the code because it's, uh, we consider it a very, very good way of actually seeing stuff. So at the bottom, you can actually see uh, a bar that you can move and this is at the, the hour level, right? So the next one, this one is actually minutes level and this is second level. So let's assume that we want to see something at this time. If you double click, we'll center in there and you can see what happened. These are different systems. We have, as you can see at the top, we have a Drupal, we have a Symfony, we have a REST web. We call it a REST web, it's a Java stack behind and there is a, a JavaScript. They all log into the same, same space. Now in this system, for example, you have uh, an interaction from a JavaScript that says, Somebody asked for a flight and then we return the flight. And this part over here shows the fact that that's not an interaction. It's not just a simple thing. It's actually a longer request. So somebody pull, uh, asked for data and then we send the, the data back after a period of time. It can be used to actually measure anything that involves time. Right? The other things you can actually see are actually dots. The dots are used to signify single moments in time, somebody clicked on something, right, or they did a, a choice in a JavaScript uh, part of the system, or they did an interaction. Now, the, the idea is that these stacks over here that you see, they're not actually hard-coded. Uh, I'll show you how, how you can actually create, but as long as you create a new type of system, we'll just generate more and more 
colors in there and actually can follow six stacks, 20 stacks. We, we don't care. It's just it's, it's a nice way of, of um, interacting with multiple systems. So let's assume that we want to see what um, Symfony did. So we can actually uncheck all the others and we filter everything on the fly. You can see only the one of the stacks. You can see two of them. It depends very much on, on what you're, you're looking for. Uh, now, this just shows you the overview. And you can actually scroll, as I said, in every single one. Let's go to the final step. This is a complete booking from selecting the flight and going to the point where you actually paid for the flight. Now, in this one, you have a user that actually submitted the button. And you can actually see that we have different uh, services that we call to do the booking. You need to validate that the price that he he's got in the cart is the right one, and you need to check that if he's got an account with the, uh, the, the um, company. And as you can see, they're actually stacked against each other, and you can actually see how they, they actually proceed and how long it took every single one. Really useful when you try to debug and see why a system is slow, because you can actually, you have a page. I'm not trying to, to replace systems like New Relic or Xdebug. But this it's it's really useful when you, you look at somebody session, particular session. And the beauty of this is that you can click on one of these, and then you have the JSON that you sent, right? And you can actually see everything that was sent in there with all the parameters, all the servers, everything that you has been sent. And then you can see it in a text form or you can see it as a raw form. So pretty much you, you can do whatever you need with this information. And this is the other end of the story. There was a request, and this is actually a response of the system, what the system responded. So you can actually debug. If something goes wrong, you can actually go and see exactly what has been sent and received and so on. I think it's a very cool way of, of actually debugging stuff, and specifically because this data goes between different stacks. You don't have another way of, of doing it really, really easy. And now I'll show you another thing, which is the website that we built. As I said, finger crossed, hopefully. Look for a flight. Let's pick a date. <coughs> right, so right now, you're gonna notice something in the header. Is a hash, or an ID, or a session, or whatever you want to call it, right? If I go to the black box timeline, which we were looking earlier, and we go to the home page, I got the same hash in here, right? Look at it, right? It's the same one. If you have a customer that you has a problem, and he says the web page doesn't work for me, I say, fine, send me your URL. They will send you the URL. They will include that hash, right? I can copy the hash, I can go here, I just go here and say, this is the hash I'm looking for. It's generating the timeline. It's actually giving me what that specific user did. Inputs, outputs, right? And it's the, the underneath system. It's not the, the browser. I don't care necessarily about the browser. If he's got an error, something went wrong, but I can actually debug it. Now, I'll go in here and let's say I'll pick a flight. Another one, and I'll hit continue. We'll take a second. It's a, Las Vegas is a very popular destination, a lot of hotels, so it takes a, a, a while to actually get all the pricing for every hotel. Just to imagine, it's, it's quite a long list with hotels and information. By the way, all the, all the content you're seeing on the screen is Drupal. It's generated and, and it's actually managed by the Drupal. This is why Drupal is very important for us. Now, if I go to the timeline, I do a refresh. That thing will show in here. And as you can see, it's a very complex call. What we did here, it's quite interesting, is the 204 that I was mentioning you earlier. The guy chose the date he's flying, all right? At that point, I can actually start calculating a lot of things for him. It's not just the hotels, because next page is hotels, but I can do a preemptive strike because I can actually go and look for cars for him and uh, attractions and all other stuff. So as you can see, we actually multi-threaded the PHP in here. We're just calling services and say, look, this guy will want probably a car rental for those particular dates. 
and please do it for us. In the background, we have uh, different uh, services. They're all written in, in, in Symfony. They actually go and talk to the Java stack and fetch the data, and then they store all the data in a location. The beauty now is that if I click continue, this, the next one is a car page. It's instant, right? Because it has been generated already for me. And I say, I don't want this one. And I go to the next page, which is another one. And this is a big one. It's almost as big as the hotel with a lot of items on this page. But this has been pre-calculated already for me. Right? While the guy was looking for the hotel, the, this data was actually parsed and, and created and, and put in memory. So it's, as I said, it's multi-threading in, in PHP. But if I go back <coughs> to our timeline, you're going to see that, see, this was the, the big call over here. But then I go here, and I can see he did something in the shopping cart. Right? And what happened with that one? And then you go to the next level. And you can actually see every single item, in, what happened in, in the timeline. And oh, another thing that I, I, I forgot to mention to you, if you look at the system, right, where you have this big call, if I start filtering, have a look at the, the other two button bars. Right? While you're filtering, it's actually changing the layouts and everything. So it, as I said, it's a very interesting way of actually seeing what's happening in time and, and doing the debugging. And this is pretty much what we worked on. And we're interested if you guys are interested to use something like this. And uh, please come to our booth, get a card, and drop us an email. Because uh, one of the plans for this application is to make it open source. But we want the community to actually come to us and say, Yes, we, w we will need something like this. And, but I wish to actually have another item in, in there. So if we, if we get enough feedback, we'll make it open source. We'll put it on GitHub, and we'll, we'll ask people to, to help and contribute and make it bigger and, and nicer. Thank you. This Apple TV, which was meant to make our lives really easy, but it, it didn't work. Really? Um, well, we've almost finished uh, our presentation here today. Um, thank you, Mikey, Georgiana, Vlad, Niku, who put all that together. Um, we've got a booth. If you'd like to stop by, have a chat, please do. We've got uh, a seated massage uh, lady there, um, Renata, who will give you a 10-minute massage for free. Um, if you've got an office in Clues, Romania, we've also spun off massage troopers, um, taking some of the things from my dot-com days in America, where we used to have free seated massages in the office. We now offer that as a service to Cluj to other technology companies. Um, and overall, um, I just want to leave you with a few thoughts. I mean, in, in the enterprise on big, you know, multi-year projects, don't sweat the small stuff. I know that seems kind of s stupid, but really, don't um, and don't spend too much time overanalyzing. If there's anything I can take away over the last few years, um, you know, we're living in 2013. <laughs> we live in a world where there's no single right option, but lots of wrong ones. Just don't choose a wrong one. It's simple. <laughs> right now. Any questions, answers, anything? Do you think a system like this will help you? <laughs> okay, we'll make it open source. Hi, amazing job you've done, guys. Congratulations. I have two questions. The first one is um, how do Drupal and Symfony communicate? Uh, if, if they're integrated or so. And the second one would be um, what is the back, back end you use for uh, the black box? Thank you. Well, okay, first of all, Drupal posts searches into Symfony. And at that point, once you're in the booking path, everything is contained within Symfony. We have a JavaScript MVC application sitting in a Drupal page, but Drupal has nothing to do once you're in the actual booking path. All the data you can see is consumed by Symfony through static views out of Drupal, but there's no actual real-time activity with Drupal. 
Okay. Sorry, what was the second question? What, uh, what is the backend you use for a black box? Well, we used it initially just to help us debug production, but it's grown into a, a couple of different things. It, you know, it helps our network operations team get to the bottom of things very quickly. I think he's interested in the technology behind it. What yeah, technology? No, oh, yeah, ha, 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 exactly. Sorry. It's a geeky question. Well, let, let me answer that one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he's the smart guy. I'm the technical guy. Uh, so what happened, we, we actually built this in having four items. The first one is an API, which is agnostic. It doesn't care about, it's, it's built actually in Silex, which is a, a, a very light form of Symfony. And because Symfony is now based of everything. I mean, it's, it's the base of everything, right? It's uh, God. Um, so Silex is actually picking up the calls. And Silex is actually delivering the 204 that I was telling you before. Now this one goes to a persister. We call it a persister. And in there, we, we, at this point, we have a MongoDB driver we're working on a couch-based driver, and we're also working on a SQL driver, which will be probably, most probably MySQL. Uh, the biggest problem we got with the MySQL, as you can imagine, is the fact that you're sending non-structured data. So we're trying to figure out a way where you can actually run uh, queries. Uh, there was another part of the, the demo that I didn't have time necessarily to show it, but uh, the beauty of the, the system is that the next part, which is the, the reader API, it's, it sits between the database, whatever the database is, and the viewer. The viewer is just a JavaScript application you've seen. And that part actually can be configured to do specific views. So for example, if you want to see, in our case, we have the uh, one item that we're using, which is, let's see the last 100 bookings, or let's see the bookings in the last 10 minutes. And the problem with that is because the data is stored in a, in a particular way, we can't do it very easily in SQL, but we're on top of that, we'll, we'll do it. So pretty much we're agnostic on the, the data uh, the, in the database or the, the structure we're storing the data. Uh, we prefer NoSQL because it's really easy and can actually scale. I mean, we've got good experience with Couchbase and Mongo and we use that, but it could be anything. So that's why we said we're gonna open it to the, the community and there will be kind of a small spec for everybody to drive on, uh, to, to, to build another driver. Make sense? Thank you, thank you. I made you job again. Okay, um, well we're almost out of time. If there's uh, no more questions, I'd just like to say thank you. And, and, and sir, that just asked the question, uh, we've got a gift up here for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks guys.